I quit my day job. My new job became driving around every Whole Foods in Northern California and like selling in the product and then standing there for hours, passing out samples, trying to get consumers to buy it so that they would like, the Whole Foods would continue to carry it. Um, So it was a very glamorous CEO life for quite a while. Hey, Power Hour fam. I'm so excited for you guys to listen to this episode. I chat with Lisa Curtis, who's the founder of Cooley Cooley Foods, and she's bringing this superfood called Moringa, which is wild. I've never heard of this before. It has amazing health benefits. It's got the energy of matcha minus the caffeine, the anti-inflammatory effects of turmeric, and more nutritional value than kale, My mind is blown. I'm so excited to learn about it, as I'm sure y'all will be too. She tells me about the operations of building Kuli Kuli, which is a social enterprise, the impact she's having with her partners on the ground in in Africa, um, as well as how she got into 13,000 Whole Foods stores, 3,000 Walmarts. It's a really cool story. Enjoy, Lisa, guys. Hi, Lisa. Hi, how's it going? Good. It's really nice to meet you. Thanks for taking the time to come chat with me. Yeah, nice to meet you too. I read all about your story and I'm so excited to learn more today. I feel like we have lots of commonalities that I'm looking forward to digging into. First of all, I've never heard of Moringa and I don't know how this is possible. So I grew up in Sierra Leone, West Africa. I'm half Sierra Leonean oh, and I have that. not heard of this. Very cool. So want to start first with, can you tell us about your story? I know you're in the Peace Corps in Niger, but I, I'd love to hear your version of it. I was introduced to it in uh, Niger, in West Africa, like you said, while I was doing the Peace Corps. I kind of the, the short version of a longer story is I was in a rural village, um, no electricity, no running water, not a lot yeah. of like healthy food or like fresh greens and I'm a vegetarian, so I basically live off salad and was not, it was mostly living off rice and just feeling kind of crappy. Um, and so I asked some of the women in my village who I was working with at this health center, you know, what can I eat to give me more nutrients, to make me feel more energized? And they literally pulled these leaves off a tree and mixed them into this popular West African peanut snack called Kuli Kuli. And they're like, eat this, you know, Moringa Cooley Cooley. It will make you feel all better. And I was like, tree leaves. I don't, I've never heard of this. I don't know. Um, it seemed a little weird, but totally trusted these women. I would be skeptical too. Totally. I was a little skeptical, but also like didn't have a lot of other better ideas. So I was like, okay, let's, let's do it. And started eating it and just really it had the most profound impact on my body of like anything I've ever eaten. Like I I was eating it every day. And like after a week, I was like, oh my gosh, I have so much more energy. I feel so much better. Like, you know, just what, what is this plant? So started doing some research next time I I got into the capital and got a little internet (laughs) again. And um, was just pretty astounded by all of the research on Moringa and just all the ways it's eaten all over the world. So, you know, you mentioned Sierra Leone. Um, I believe in in parts of Sierra Leone and other parts of West Africa, it's known as the tree of life. It's also called mother's milk. A lot of women use it for lactation, um, for like general wellness. It's um, used in Ayurvedic medicine. It's known as the national vegetable of the Philippines. Um, so it's just eaten all over the world. And I was like, why have I never heard of this? And why, you know, why isn't this in the U.S.? Um, and so I started asking some of the women in my village, you know, what could I do literally to just help them grow and use more of it locally? And they said what I think any small farmer anywhere will say, like, we're not going to grow a crop that we can't sell. So why don't you help us sell it? And that will help us grow more and use more. And I was like, sure, no problem. Like, I'll help you sell this in the U.S. And that was 
2010 and I'm still doing it. So um, it's 12 years later. It's been a wild, yes, exactly. It's been a wild ride. (laughs) That is fascinating because even as you're talking about the ways it's eaten or even called in Sierra Leone, I've not heard of it. And so this makes me feel like we need better marketing for this. Just looking at the nutritional value, I'm awestruck by it. I want to talk about the nutritional value because big, jam-packed, lots of great things in this plant. I was reading from your website and it has more nutritional value than kale, anti-inflammatory impacts like turmeric. I think the energy of matcha minus the caffeine, this antioxidants, essential amino acids sounds incredible. So tell me more about what the benefits are. And I'd love to also hear more actually about how you, what you were feeling when you said after a week, you were feeling so much better and this really impacted you. There are a lot of, a lot of different benefits, both on the nutritional in the sense that Moringa is extremely nutritionally dense. Um, one Mm -hmm. of the ways that a scientific advisor of ours describes it is Yeah, she says that, you know, most plants are 90% water. So there's only like a little bit of room for all the nutrients. And Moringa is 80% water. So there's like twice as much room for all of these protein, calcium, iron, vitamins. Um, And then on the medicinal side, like you said, there's, you know, been some really interesting research about Moringa potentially having more anti-inflammatory benefits than turmeric and um, just having some some really cool medicinal properties. So uh, for me, I think, and for a lot of our customers, the sort of thing you feel the most is just you feel more energized and not in a like caffeinated way. There's no caffeine in Moringa, but in a like, oh, my body is getting the nutrients it needs to feel good. Um, so you can almost think of it as like nature's multivitamin. I love that. And I love that it's natural. Exactly. Yeah. How much of these nutrients are preserved? Because I know that we're providing it in terms of shots, in powdered form, in energy bars. Do we lose any of that? Should we be worried about that? How do we think about that as a consumer? Yeah. So we we do have a few different versions that we make. Um, So we have the raw green moringa powder, which people often add to smoothies, or you can even do kind of lattes or other things. Um, And then we, like you said, salad is like kind of other supplement blends or also some snack products um, with the the bark in our bars. Um, You know, in general, we try to make sure that we're not cooking the Moringa too much um, because, you know, same thing with like if you you really cook spinach and then you dump out all the water, you leach a lot of the nutrients, Um, but it can withstand a bit of heat. So we're, we're pretty careful in how we process it um, and ensure that like our products have kind of a, you know, functional or, or medicinal enough dose. Okay. Are you doing the processing in the farms after harvesting? <clears throat> yeah. How does that work? Yeah. So we do uh, stage one processing happens in country. So basically... You can imagine like these little trees and they pull the leaves off the tree, they wash them, they dry them, and then they mill them into a powder. And then that powder is shipped here to the U.S. And then we create it um, into kind of the different final form factors. So, you know, whether that's packing it into a pouch and selling it as a green powder or adding it to a bar, a shot or, or chocolate bark, lots of different ways to do it. <laughs> That's awesome. I loved ways that you're presenting use cases for Moringa. I think love seeing different ideas of how I can eat healthier. And I was laughing when you said this chocolate bark because I also saw some crackers on your website and ways you can just add the Moringa powder to these crackers and have it maybe on your charcuterie board or yeah. or whatnot. So yeah, I and love we have creative a lot ways. of like awesome bloggers and kind of, you know, Instagram influencer type folks who get really creative, with like all different ways to use it. Do you have a favorite? Yes. Um, I mean, I'm always partial to like the, both the old and the new. So I'll give you, I'll give yeah. you, I'll give you three favorites. I have to put it down. Um, So our pure moringa powder, I add to my oatmeal and my toddler's oatmeal every morning. We make superfood oatmeal. 
She's two. She loves it. So I'm like, you know, if we can get a two-year-old to eat it, I think everybody should. And that's just like a really great way to kind of start my day and give me the tools I need to feel good. Mm -hmm. Um, I then also really love our gummies. We launched superfood gummies and we have, um, especially our greens gummy, which like there's a lot of people who are skeptical of greens. There's a lot of greens gummies on the market that taste really bad. Um, ours, we managed to get 400 milligrams of greens in there and it tastes great. Um, and so I love that one, especially like on days when you're not getting enough greens from other places, it's nice to just know that you have that added boost. Um, and then actually on Tuesday, we launched three new products. Um, oh, congrats. Our, yeah, thank you. It's been a wild week, um, <laughs> which is our new superfood blends. Um, and those, we made our first ever product without Moringa, which was kind of a wild a wild step okay. for us. Um, and it's a product with baobab and hibiscus, which you've mm. maybe seen in Sierra Leone. It's definitely. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah. Our, our logistics manager grew up in Gambia and he's like, this is like every, everyone should know this one. <laughs> um, and it's, it's amazing. such an amazing flavor and also like really cool functional benefits behind it. Um, and that's kind of, you know, emblematic of the direction we want to go is where we really feel like sourcing from small farming communities, primarily on the African continent, you know, growing moringa and baobab and hibiscus and all these other climate smart nutrient rich crops and then selling products made of them is, is kind of the way that we We'll continue to grow. So it's, it was exciting to do that, launch that. And it, I just love it. I'm like drinking it every morning. I love that. So it sounds like you are expanding past Moringa to other nutritional products that come from smaller farms where you can support some of these other farmers too. Yeah. So many of them are actually from the same farms or from the same kind of like types of communities um, and mm -hmm. we, we just think that we can do similar to what we did with Moringa, where we have taken a product that not a lot of people have heard of. And then, you know, this year it was like on the New York times list and on Whole Foods list of like top trend of 2022, um, that we can do that with I some other that. really cool ingredients as well. Have you heard of athletic greens? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I drink this every day, every morning and I struggle with drinking and so I add it to smoothies because I just need a new way of consuming. So it's nice to hear some of your ideas. And I love that you're introducing your toddler to healthy eating habits so early. That's so important. For a consumer like me, would I compare Athletic Greens to a Meringue with Kuli Kuli? Would I be able to switch them out? Because I almost consume Athletic Greens as like my multivitamin, yeah. making sure I get all the <clears throat> nutrient packs for the day. For sure. I mean, I think, um, so Athletic Greens is great. They've done a, a wonderful job of creating their blend of, you know, dozens of different greens. Um, I think it's really about kind of what you're optimizing for. I think for us, we're a big believer in like, you kind of need a fair amount of greens. And often, like if you're just consuming a lot of different things in very small quantities, you're not necessarily getting all of the functional benefits. Um, and I think the cool thing about Moringa is that it's one of the most nutritious greens on the planet. And so having like just, you know, a full, full serving and a, a like fully functional dose, I think has, um, you know, for some people an even more of an impact than athletic greens because you really do get like all of the qualities of this really nutritious plant cool so I'll send i can't you some wait to try so test it out you should, please do i'd love to test it on all about healthy eating and infusing that into our days awesome so want to bring us back to your story we were at the point where you were not feeling great and then you tried moringa felt better after about a week and you like me, you're like, wait, how have I not heard about this? We need to bring this to the U.S. Want to learn more about 
how you were able to bring this to the U.S. I have a background of running a nonprofit, and I know that's very hard to get logistics off the ground in West Africa. And so I want to hear about some of your challenges and how those first few years went. And now looking back 12 years later, you're in Whole Foods, you're, like you said, on all of these lists, which is phenomenal progress. But yeah, how did it start you. for you? Yeah, I mean, I think we realized really early on that like we are not experts in growing and processing mm -hmm. Moringa and that we really needed to find amazing partners who were. Um, so the first group we partnered with was in northern Ghana, in an area called Tamale, um, with this group of women's cooperatives who like was already producing, they're actually exporting and selling in, in one single store in New York. Um, and, you know, they had sort of realized that it's really hard to like run a business in Ghana and, you know, be producing all this product and doing everything there and also try to sell it. Um, and so, you know, we kind of found each other and we're like, okay, this could work great. Like we'll, we'll do the, the, the sales and marketing and kind of like the piece here in the U S and you all handle like the, you know, growing and processing. And I think in, in many respects, it's like the really hard part of doing this. Um, and, you know, we'll assist with quality control and like doing all the testing and um, kind of making sure that we have a product that, that will meet the FDA requirements, meet Whole Foods requirements um, and get that going. And so that's actually how we've worked. Um, so we don't have operations outside of the U.S., um, but we do have partners for whom, you know, many of them, we are 60 to 80 percent of their business. Um, and generally, they will grow Moringa, they'll grow other crops, they'll sell products locally in their communities. Um, and then we are kind of their main um, if not only export client. Um, and it's, it's cool, you know, to see what that can have. Cause I think they, they get a lot of just like in their community sort of interest from the community of like, why is everyone interested in Moringa? Like, how are you selling it? How, you know, these Americans <laughs> love Moringa. Like, oh, maybe we should, you know, take a look at this a little more. Maybe we should try it. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> um, it does have, like, even, you know, in my village in Niger, you would see this. It has a little bit of a stigma. It's like a poor person's crop. Um, so I, the one of the things I, I learned while I was there is there's, you know, a pretty distinct hunger season in Niger and in a lot of other places where, the old harvest is running out. The new harvest has not yet arrived. That's when often there's the highest rates of malnutrition. Um, and Moringa is one of the few plants that can grow year round. It grows very hot, dry places. Um, and so it's often eaten a lot during that season. Um, and so it's almost like kale of 10 years ago where, you know, kale was like the number one consumer of kale 10 years ago was actually Pizza Hut. Um, and they were not adding it to their pizzas. They were using the leaves as decoration on their salad bars to like make it look nice. So, so you know, kale's, kale's come away a long way from being this backyard leaf. And I think what we're really hoping to do is get Moringa to kind of get away from this like poor person's crop to like, oh, this is actually a super nutritious, super powerful plant that everyone should be eating. I love that. What a fun fact about kale. I had no idea. And look where we are now. It's like kale, superfood. Everyone's trying to get their kale in. Yeah. So hopefully uh, 10 years from now, that'll be Moringa. I love it. Let's do it. <laughs> this brings me to your mission. You've alluded a little bit to it. What is your mission with Kuli Kuli? What are you hoping to accomplish and how are you doing that? Yeah. So our mission is to improve nutrition and livelihoods worldwide through selling nutrient-rich plants like Moringa. Um, you know, I say that the like, because like I, like I said earlier, we yeah, want you're expanding. Um, to kind of continue to expand and um, the ways that we do that. So we partner directly with small farmers. So we're, we're not using brokers or bail men. We really are working with these communities and we're figuring out like, okay, you know what, how can we help you scale? We've done a lot of like pre-harvest financing. We've done a lot of, you know, different structures, different technical assistance or, you know, supporting with like kind of grant, um, that kind of thing in mm -hmm. order to get 
them to a place where they can have, you know, Moringa be a really great crop for them. Yeah. And I know you've also been able to plant trees, provide livelihoods for farmers, yeah. so social yeah. business. So the, the, the cool thing about selling tree leaves is that you plant a lot of trees. Um, so Moringa, Moringa is a tree. Um, and so, you know, the more Moringa we sell, the more trees we plant and we're not just planting this, uh, planting trees and sort of like a monoculture take over everything. We really are trying to do it in a very like regenerative and kind of systematic fashion where a lot of our farmers will intercrop Moringa with some of the other crops that we sell locally, um, or they'll intercrop it with, um, you know, different different smaller farms. And so it's a cool way of getting a lot more trees and a lot more erosion control and and wind breaks in the community as well. Absolutely. For people that are looking at folks like you and really inspired and want to start a social business, maybe they've also been in the Peace Corps, or maybe they're going on a trip and want to help. From my experience, starting a business Entering entrepreneurship is super hard, ridden with so many challenges. It's also ridden with so many highs. So I'd love to ask you, what are some of your biggest challenges? You can maybe tell me one or two that have been the biggest challenges you've had to overcome as an entrepreneur. And then on the flip side of that, you can tell me about what the biggest joys have been for you on your journey. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, I could list challenges all day to narrow it down to two. I mean, I think there's there's like... Two very clear ones. We are selling an ingredient that most Americans have never heard of. And we are sourcing an ingredient that is not a commodity. It's a specialty crop um, from small farmers on the other side of the world. So, you know, challenges one and two. I think the ways we're overcoming the first in terms of awareness is really having a lot of hustle. Like we... You know, we used to do pre-COVID, we did like 500 demos a year. So we had people in stores, talking to customers, passing out samples, telling the story, just like hustling, hustling, hustling. Um, We also, I think one of the benefits of being a social enterprise is we have an interesting story. You know, there's like a lot of meat behind our supply chain, behind our like vision and purpose it's not we're not we're not just another food company there's like a lot of unique stuff so we get a lot of great press um we sometimes get you know various influencers or people to talk about us without us paying for it which is amazing when it happens (laughs) um and then I think on the supply chain side that has been one of the most challenging aspects of COVID for us is that you know it used to cost me roughly $3,000 and take three months to get a container of Moringa from Kampala, Uganda to Oakland, California. And now it costs anywhere between nine to $20,000 if it gets stuck in the port um, and can take nine months. Um, So our costs, (laughs) our transit time, our, you know, even just getting Moringa like out of many of the communities we source from like during COVID, like it, it, I think a lot of people don't know that like a lot of African countries went into lockdown in a way that like didn't get covered. Like Americans like have no idea what it means to have like a lockdown mm-hmm. where like literally like things stopped functioning, like markets stopped opening, like you couldn't get food in a lot of places. And it was just wild. I mean, we, we did everything we could to support, but at the end of the day, like, we couldn't get Moringa for a while from a lot of our great partners. Um, so I think we are continuing <laughs> to rebuild our supply chain. And we're sort of still in the rebuilding process um, and are, you know, starting to scale up. I think it's, it, it just, it takes a long time. Um, and that is, I think, an ongoing challenge that will, probably continue to last at least another year or two. I don't think logistics are going to clear up anytime soon, unfortunately. Totally. Very familiar with this. I worked with a supply chain, like a physical product company that was importing goods from China and similar prices, three, four, five X in terms of shipping costs. Did this translate to an increase in prices of your products? Or are you, you swallowing know, I wish all of those? It had. <laughs> we are unfortunately in a place where 
Um, we're already very premium on shelf. So if you go you okay. know, into a Whole Foods today, you'll see our powder at $19.99. You'll see our gummies at $24.99. You'll see um, like our bar is at like $2.99. Um, long story short, we're so premium to the category that we like we can't cross the $20 threshold. We can't cross the $25 threshold. Um, so we actually have not raised prices at all. Um, we've just taken a pretty steep margin hit. Um, and we're okay. We're, we're get, we'll get through it. It'll get better. <laughs> um, I think our, yeah. our world will be fixed eventually. Um, but for the moment, it has uh, definitely impacted our margin. Yeah. And so many companies can relate. I do hope it gets better with time and you're building your supply chain, but that's a tough one. Totally. And then on your previous one, Lisa, you mentioned hustling and that's so important in building a business. You got to hustle through all the no's. If it's a no, it's just a no for now, not yet for forever. Right. It's just a not yet. Were you in stores before you had deals with these stores? And I know Whole Foods is huge. How did you get into Whole Foods? Yeah, I am a big believer in just persistence in all forms. (laughs) Um, So in terms of kind of Whole Foods specifically, that was an interesting one. That was our first break and it remains our best sales meeting that we've ever had. Like I have yet to have a better one um, where essentially we at the time were sampling at farmer's markets. We were doing some consumer testing there, really trying to understand like, will people buy this? Should we quit our day jobs? Are we going to go all in on this superfood that nobody's ever heard of? Um, And we were getting pretty good results. And um, somebody who works for Whole Foods came by and was like, oh, this is really interesting. Have you thought of trying to present to the buyer and trying to submit this? And I was like, yeah, I would love to. Like, how do I do that? Um, So they connected us. Um, We ended up getting a meeting. It was, so I came back from Peace Corps and dragged a couple of childhood friends who one had a lot of experience in consumer packaged goods, one had a lot of experience in startups. And it's like, I don't know how to do this. Come do it with me. Um, So me and my uh, childhood best friend, Valerie, like stayed up all night, like making these little bars by hand. So that was our first product was Moringa bars, Mm -hmm. like putting together this awesome pitch. We like walked in there. We felt so prepared. And the buyer was literally like, oh, Moringa, I just saw this on Dr. Oz. Like, we don't have any Moringa products. I think we should. Let's do it. We were like, what? Really? Is it all going to be like this? Is it all going to be this easy? It's not. And we've never had that kind of a sales meeting since. But um, that was very cool. It was not quite the break that we had like thought. I think in our minds, we were like, did she just put us in 500 stores? Um, she did not. She put us in one store in Oakland, mm-hmm. California. Test you out. And then we had to hustle and go to store to store. Um, So I actually, uh, we all still had day jobs. I quit my day job. My new job became driving around to every Whole Foods in Northern California and like selling in the product and then standing there for hours, passing out samples, trying to get consumers to buy it so that they would like, the Whole Foods would continue to carry it. Um, So it was a very glamorous CEO life for quite a while. (laughs) That's the startup hustle. You're getting the coffee, changing the fax machine, driving to all the Whole Foods and handing out bars of your product and hoping people will try it. It reminds me of Sarah Blakely's story with Spanx, how she went to all of these stores and was literally selling her Spanx. Yes, right totally. Then and there. You have to. I think, you know, <laughs> it's that is that is how it works. Just continue to hustle and I think your point about like no's being not yet is is really, really important. One thing I tell entrepreneurs, especially women entrepreneurs, especially people of color who are just going to get more no's is that like, do like anybody, any investor who says no, make a list, keep that person on their list, keep them updated, let them know once a quarter, all the great wins, all the great progress you've had. It is something I have been doing since 2014 
And literally our series B, $2 million of it came from somebody who told me no in 2015. I emailed this guy for so many years, <laughs> like literally yeah. four years. And then he put $2 million into our series B. Um, even though he had said no, he just was like, you know, I believe in you and I believe in your hustle. And I was like, all right, if that, if that nets me $2 million, I will take it. <laughs> Yeah. And congrats on that. And such a powerful message because I think it's hard for someone who doesn't know you to trust you based off of one meeting, but you can build this trust by showing. I think your actions speak so much louder than your words. And so giving these investors an opportunity to see your progress to your point, quarter to quarter, your wins, your persistence, your resilience, how scrappy and crafty you are and innovative and the team you're building, et cetera, builds a ton of confidence that an investor won't get from just meeting you in one meeting. And so that's extremely powerful. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. Just... I'm such a fan of your progress and, and the mission and everything you're doing. This is wonderful. Tell me about your joys before I let you go. Like why should folks enter entrepreneurship, want to build a social business, go into something like this? What, what have been some of your highs? Oh, so many highs. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's amazing. It is such an honor. It is like such a privilege to wake up every day and be like, I get to work on my baby. And there's like other people working on my baby, you know, like there are now other people who are like super fired up about Moringa and about Cooley Cooley's mission and like really trying to do this. Um, so I, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't feel joyful every single day but I think in the in the net it absolutely does and then there's like amazing moments like you know when we got into Walmart and then the best part was not just getting in but it was like then we got expanded in Walmart and we're now in like 3,000 Walmart stores and I'm like who would have thought that like we would be doing well at Walmart, you know? Um, like right. That is wild to me that like there are mainstream consumers, it's not just a Whole Foods product, um, who are buying our product. Right, because it's this higher price point product. Um, we, I mean, we sell we sell to Whole Foods and we sell to Walmart at roughly the same price, um, but the margins that they take are very different. And so um, okay. it is a different price point on the shelf. Um, okay. but yeah, that is a big high. And then I think, you know, one of the saddest parts of COVID for me has not been able to travel and visit all of our supplier partners. Cause those are such highs to just like, see like the impact that we can have. And like, you know, we've sourced about five and a half million dollars of Moringa from small farmers, which, you know, in Silicon Valley, we're all just like, ah, five million dollars. Like that's not that much, but in like, rural Uganda or like Northern Ghana, like right. these numbers like make a real difference and they make a real impact. And it's so cool to see that. Yeah. Incredible. How many Whole Foods stores are you in nowadays? All of them. All of them. Yeah. Wow. From this one. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, no longer just one. Um, yeah. So we, we went nationwide with Whole Foods in 2016 um, and we're actually in 11,000 stores now. So you can find our product everywhere from like Whole Foods to Walmart, CVS. Um, we occasionally do rotations in Costco. So um, we're in, in quite a few more places. Amazing. I am excited to go to my Whole Foods, which is down the street, and go try some of Kuli Kuli's Moringa products out. And maybe I'll get to try the Baobab and Hibiscus ones too when they launch. Can't wait. Next April. So yes, coming, Next coming April. soon. Um, but everything is online right now. Um, but yeah, uh, yes, that would be amazing. And I tell people, you know, the absolute best thing they can do is like find somebody who works at Whole Foods and be like, hey, this brand is awesome. <laughs> do you know how awesome this brand is? I'm so glad you have it. Because then they're like, oh, customers are excited about this. I should be excited about this. I should tell other customers about this. Um, so that's like the best thing you could possibly do. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like what you hear, leave a review and share. One, two, three.